Thank you. Well, like all of us, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together the conference and especially for this very nice, relaxed atmosphere. As you get older, you start to appreciate the long breaks, the long and nice uh, lunches and the short talks. So thank you for this relaxed style. And in the spirit of the relaxed style, I'm proposing a relaxed talk. So I'm not going to break any speed limit. Uh, at least I hope not. And um, yeah, I thought I would talk about non-emission spin chain and non-unitary CFTs. I'm, I have not worked much on entanglement in the last couple of years. So this is a slightly old topic. But I thought it might be useful because it, it's a way to talk about lattice models and conformal field theories in, in a fashion that hasn't been really mentioned so far. So that's work in collaboration with Romain Couvreur, with Couvreur, Saler, and Vasseur. You're really uh, getting a nice sample of French names. And Jesper Jacobson. All right, so the first slide is a standard slide which I'll go over very quickly. No point arguing that entanglement is useful, or at least it's fun calculating. And I'll put myself mostly in the context of one-dimensional systems, and I remind you of the very well-known result that if you have a 1D CFT, a gapless spin chain in the ground state, and if you look at the entanglement of a region of size L with the rest of the system, entanglement being defined as follows, so it's important to be clear about the definition. In the unitary case, rho is just a projector onto the ground state, with this left and right ground states are the same. And as you well know, you define a reduced density operator by tracing over B, and you define the entanglement as trace over A of rho A log of rho A. And one of the standard results in this field is that this entanglement scales like C over 3 log of L over A, where A is a cutoff, and that would be an equality in the field theory. If you have a lattice model, of course, you need L over A much larger than one, so you can take the continuum limit. And C is the central charge, okay? The well-known result, everybody knows it, we've seen it all times already. Now, the context in which I want to consider this relation is the context of non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, um, which are important in a variety of contexts and probably getting more important over the years. So here are some of the examples where non-Hermitian Hamiltonians quote-unquote, appear. Of course, as you well know, there is a description of open quantum systems where you're trying to recover the loss of coherence by artificially putting some sort of dissipative terms in the Hamiltonians. That's one example. Not the kind of example I'm going to discuss much. There are many statistical mechanics systems, 2D statistical mechanics or 1D quantum spin chains, which are perfectly honorable and interesting from the point of view of statistical mechanics, like the study of self-avoiding walks, polymers, hard hexagon, and all that, and which do not correspond to a Hermitian Hamiltonian. They are described by a field theory which is not unitary. Um, more physical, maybe, there are a lot of interesting phase transitions, quantum critical points, typically those occurring in non-interacting disordered electronic systems in two plus one dimensions, so systems which are perfectly unitary, but we know how to study them by doing some sort of dimensional reduction and averaging over disorder, and when you do all this, you end up from two plus one to one plus one, which is nice, but it happens that you have lost unitarity. So there again, the plateau transition between uh, the transition between integer plateaus in the quantum Hall effect, for instance, is supposed to be described by a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, in one-dimensional quantum mechanics. In fact, more generally, for various reasons coming from string theory as well as condensed matter physics, we are extremely interested in 2D field theories or 1 plus 1D quantum systems, which involves uh, supergroup symmetry super manifold or the autosymplectic or super unitary type. And all these theories, again, are not unitary as field theories or they are involved non Hermitian Hamiltonians. So this is a very bizarre world where, for instance, probability may be conserved in quantum processes, but some probabilities may be positive and other negative, and weirder things could occur. 
Okay, so the question is, is entanglement useful in any of these situations? And that's what I want to discuss a bit today. So uh, what I will do today is simply consider some very simple examples of non Hermitian quantum spin chains and see what we can do with entanglement in this case. And I'll restrict to CFTs because it's uh, complicated enough as it is. So remember that the central charge which occurred in the entanglement is also, of course, in a CFT, something that tells you how the ground state of the theory on the circle of circumference length of circumference L scales, and it's well known that when you constructed a non-universal extensive term, the ground state energy scales as minus pi over 6 L times the central charge. Now, the role of non-unitarity in conformal field theory has been investigated quite a bit not when you're thinking about the entanglement, but in the context of ground state energies. In fact, in the case of minimal non-unitary CFTs, I don't think I'll have time to explain what this means, really, this minimal, but these are conformal field theories that look a lot like the standard unitary minimal theories, only they have slightly different values of the central charge, and the Yang-Li singularity is one example of these. These theories are non-unitary, well-defined conformal field theories, and it's well known that one of the consequences of the non-unitarity is that some of the conformal weights are negative. We are still in a context where the conformal weights are real. The eigenvalues of the lattice Hamiltonians are real, I'll get back to this point later, but some of the conformal weights are negative, which means there exist states whose weight is below the ground state. And it's a well-known observation going back to 1986, I think, that in the case of these theories, instead of the central charge appearing in the scaling of the ground state energy, what you have in the scaling of the ground state energy is instead what's called the effective central charge, which is obtained by shifting the central charge by 24 times the lowest conformal weight in the theory. So the fact that it's a 24 is a kind of technical, but the point is very simple. The ground state in a conformal field theory is associated with the identity operator, and that's a conformal state of conformal weight zero. If you have a state of negative conformal weight, surely this is what's going to determine the corrections to scaling of the lowest energy state, which you'll call the ground state, naively, and this is going to be another value of C. In fact, it's C minus 24 H min. So, for instance, for the Yang-Li singularity, where the central charge is minus 22 over 5, the effective central charge is 2 over 5, and like I said, it's well known that this is the quantity controlling the scaling of the ground state energy. Okay. So, the guess has been around for many years that if you were to look at the entanglement in this exact same situation, imagine you take the Yang-Li singularity, the corresponding Hamiltonian, which I'm not going to write, but it's very easy to write. And if you did this calculation in what looks like the ground state of the theory, you would presumably get, uh, sorry, get that this entanglement should go like the effective central charge over 3 log of L over A. All right, this naive result is in fact pretty hard to prove. And uh, one of the reasons why it's hard is because the origin of the result is a little bit mysterious. You see, when you look at the correction of the ground state energy, the fact that you get the effective central charge instead of the ordinary central charge is simply because you have identified the wrong ground state. If you are in the right ground state, the lowest energy state, you will get C effective instead of C. But it is a well-known result in CFT that if you look at the entanglement, not in the ground state, but in an excited state of the conformal field theory, you will in fact find the same entanglement. You will find the same C over 3 log L over A, not C effective. So the fact that you get C effective instead of C does not occur because you are in the wrong ground state. It must occur for some other reason. And that reason is not clear to me, despite the existence of several beautiful papers by these people, and Olaja is in the room, um, who have kind of shown that indeed this is what happens, although it's based on some hypothesis, and it's a delicate calculation. So my goal is mostly to revisit this result from a very elementary point of view by starting to ask myself really what entanglement might mean in a non-unitary case, and I will derive this result in some simple examples, and then I'll discuss some conclusions and uh, 
prospects. All right? So one of the most interesting questions is probably the following. Imagine you measure the entanglement and you find this. How do you know whether what you're measuring is the effective central charge or the real central charge? How could you get the real central charge if by measuring the entanglement you get the effective central charge? What should you do? All right, so this was an advanced introduction, so to speak. And now I'm going to go down to extremely elementary things because I want to discuss just some simple examples. So the example I'm going to discuss is the entanglement in so-called quantum group symmetric spin chains because there are a very comfortable example where we can study the effect of non-unitarity. So let's take a spin chain which is going to be a little bit like the XXZ spin chain only the elementary interaction between neighboring spins instead of being your usual XXZ Hamiltonian, which would be given by this part, is also going to have a little bit different part, which involves Q minus Q minus 1 over 2, sigma IZ minus sigma I plus 1Z. Okay, so in the ordinary XXZ, you only have these three terms. The beauty about this additional term is that, well, on the one hand, if Q is imaginary, sorry, if Q is complex, a complex number of modulus 1, to which I will restrict, the beauty of this term is, on the one hand, it makes the local interaction not Hermitian, although it's PT symmetric, by the way. But on the other hand, and more interestingly, this local interaction happens to commute with an object, which some of you may know, which is called a quantum group, UQSL2. So this quantum group is a deformation of the usual SL2, and the action of the generators on the spin chain is a little bit complicated because it involves not only raising and lowering operators on the site I, as you would have in ordinary SL2, but also you have tails. You see, you have Q to the power sigma Z to the left, Q to the power minus sigma Z to the right, which kind of twist the action of the generators, and these terms are necessary in order to ensure commutation with EI. And these are generators of the so-called quantum group SL2, and in particular, it's well known that this satisfies this commutation relation. Commutator S plus S minus is Q to the 2SZ minus Q to the minus 2SZ over Q minus Q inverse, which is called a quantum deformation of the usual SL2. So it's interesting for several reasons. First of all, although the structure of the Hilbert space, quote-unquote, is a tensor product, the action of the generators is not really the standard action in a tensor product because left and right are treated differently. And this is related with what's called non-co-commutative Hopf algebras, which is an interesting concept I'll mention a little bit more in the following. Anyway, what I want to do is make a spin chain out of these generators and ask myself what is the entanglement in these spin chains. Let's do some very simple examples, okay? Let's take n equals 2. Yeah? How do I find what? Let's do it for n equals 2 first. We'll see what the ground state is, okay? So n equals 2 is two spins. The Hamiltonian is just E1 acting on two spins. And it's an easy exercise that I'm not doing to show that the uh, Hamiltonian, though it's not Hermitian, has real eigenvalues, one which is 0, degenerate once, and once which is minus Q plus Q inverse, which is degenerate three times. So to answer your question, if I take Q in the proper quadrant of the circle, this is going to be the lowest energy and this is going to be associated with the ground state. Okay? So, the ground state will be the state on which the Hamiltonian acting on the right state is equal to that ground state energy times the state itself. And it's very easy to see. It's 1 over square root of 2, q to the minus a half plus minus, minus q to the half minus plus. Okay? The state, as I wrote here, is normalized for the ordinary scalar product, where when we take the bra associated with the ket, we take the complex conjugate of the coefficients. Remember, q is a complex number of modulus 1. So it's easy to build the density operator. Rho is rho 0, 0. Choosing for the subsystem A the left spins, um, that is tracing over B gives us the density operator rho A, which is a half times the identity, and of course you find SA equals log 2 independent of Q. Okay? Now, I'm not happy with this result because of course I have a lot of structure in this state. 
have a lot of structure in these generators. It's a little sad that at the end I get leg two, exactly the same log I would make for an XX chain or an XXX spin chain. Okay? Now, of course, you can do better. That's the idea. The way to do better is, first of all, to worry about left and right eigenstates and observe that this simple Hamiltonian, in fact, because Q is a complex number of modulus 1, has left and right eigenstates which are different, or if you wish, the eigenstate of H and the eigenstate of H dagger are not the same, so we'll call them right eigenstate and left eigenstates, okay? And then if you normalize right and left eigenstates like this, so in general we'll have two right and two left eigenstates, and we're going to normalize them so that left scalar product right is equal to 1, if the states are the same, otherwise it's 0. So if we do, you redo the calculation for the left and the right eigenstates normalized in this way, A, and if you define the density operator, and that's a very important point, we are not defining the density operator as O, O, we're defining it as O right, O left, we're defining it as the projector onto the right eigenstate. And this is, by the way, what you must do in a conformal field theory, as I'll discuss in a couple of minutes. So if we define the density operator that way, then it's an easy calculation to see that the density operator now is a bit different. It's got this Q minus 1 and Q in the diagonal instead of 1 and 1. Okay, so that's step number 1. Essentially, I define the density operator that way. Step number 2. I'm going to take the trace over the B subsystem, not the naive trace, but a modified trace. And the reason has to do with this, the existence of these bizarre tails of powers of Q in the generators. Um, the reason is, if you wish, that I want, after tracing over B, to obtain a density operator for the system A that will still commute with your QSL2. And that's not so trivial, and it turns out that's what you have to do. So if you do this definition for the partial trace, so from now on, whenever we trace on the right, we put the Q to the minus 2 to the minus sigma BZ, and when we trace on the left, we get trace with a Q to the plus sigma AZ. When we take this modified trace, it's a bit complicated, but the point is, in the end, you get an entanglement that's more interesting. It's log of Q plus Q inverse. And those of you who know about quantum groups or Hopf-Algebras know that it's quite nice because this is the Q dimension of the spin half representation. So this is a way to go from the log 2, boring, to log Q plus Q minus 1, which I consider more interesting, at least for this baby spin chain, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to explain. It was the difference between left and right eigenstates, and how on a very simple example you can massage the algebra in order to get a non-trivial entanglement of the left spin with the right spin. What it means physically, We'll get back to this a little later, okay? Now, before I do that, I could keep playing with my spin chains, but one of my goals is to also introduce loop models, because I think they're very interesting in a lot of contexts, and I think it's worth discussing them in this room as well. So what are loop models, okay? Well, we're going to forget now a little bit about our quantum group business. Instead, I'm going to remind you... Yeah? Could you use the microphone? Sorry, is, do you mind? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No, I just wanted to ask you something about this, uh, this Q to the sigma, this operator you introduced in there. So I know this is a very simple example, but um, does this, in general, allow you to have something that is uh, that has always positive definite eigenvalues? Is that what that operator does, or is just in this case? Really, what the operator does is guarantee that this commutes with the quantum group. That's all. That's that's necessary. But if you that. if you didn't have it there, you would also have probably a density matrix that is not positive definite. I I guess. I don't know. Honestly, I forgot because a little bit. I think that's kind of the problem. You would expect that if you put right and left states, then you yeah, you're right. Okay. You have an operator yeah. that's not necessarily no, this is true. This is also true. Definite. You're right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So perhaps that has the effect of um, of making everything 
positive, <laughs> which is well, nice. Well, it does make it positive, definitely. Yeah. It's something one can show in general, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so let's talk a bit about algebras and loops. So here is the temple Elib algebra, which is, turns out to be an algebra satisfied by this little generator here. And it's a projector algebra, e square is q plus q minus 1 times e. And there's a free body relation, which I'm not going to use particularly, but I thought anyway it might be amusing to remind you of what it is. And the point is that this is going to help me define a loop model a little later on. But this algebra has a simple graphical representation. So what I want to do is move from the laborious spins and q to the sigma z to loops. That's what I call towards loop models. So the idea is very simple. Instead of having spins, instead of having your Hilbert space with n spins, what you now imagine you have is n strings. And then the action of EI of the Hamiltonian elementary nearest neighbor Hamiltonian on strings is simply to contract two strings onto a singlet and produce another singlet. This is what this action represents. And it's easy to see, for instance, that this relation, E square is Q plus Q minus 1 E, comes from this kind of diagram. And the free body relation, which I'm not really going to use, but it's amusing to write anyway, E1, E2, E1 is equal to E1, comes simply from isotropy by drawing and pulling strings. All right, so what is the point of this algebra? Well, it gives us a new way to think of the entanglement, a new graphical way. So instead of thinking of h in terms of spin, h is minus e1, I'm going to think of it acting on loops, okay? So acting on loops, this Hamilton is just minus this generator, and I'm going to find an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian by taking loops. Well, that's very simple. I can easily find the eigenstate. Remember, I said n is q plus q inverse. If I act with e1 on this, what do I do? I close that loop and I reopen one. So this is obviously an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And when I do this, I produce a loop. And remember, a loop e squared is n times e. So a loop has weight n. Therefore, I obtain a state for which h o is minus n times o. Okay? So that's a new way to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Very simple. And now in this new language, I'm not going to worry about right eigenstate and left eigenstate. I'm just going to take the density operator as O O with remembering that whenever I take the conjugate of a state, what I must do is simply build the flipped image of the state I had. So O right state is a loop with the legs pointing up. O as a bra uh, will be the same but with the two legs of the loop pointing down. So this is the density operator. And it's very easy now to take the partial trace on the rightmost spin. What do I do to take the partial trace on the rightmost spin? I connect this leg with that leg. That's it. And then I pull, so I have a single line. So rho a is simply just this. And if I calculate minus trace of rho a log of rho a, then I will easily, it's an easy calculation to see. I'll find log n, which is I w what I wanted, log of q plus q inverse, okay? Which is the same as the quantum group entanglement. So based on this simple example, I can claim, make a few claims. So this quantum group entanglement entropy, as I call it, can be defined more generally for systems of many spins. And it obeys many interesting properties naturally required from entanglement. There's quite a few properties you might want to explore in particular. Um, again, like I said, the fact that when you take trace over B, the reduced density matrix, is positive definite and commutes with A. It's particularly tricky if you want multi-cut entanglement, but this can be done also. And in fact, it raises the question, a, a mathematical question certainly, but when you have a system whose Hilbert space is not a tensor product, but something more complicated, where you can, well, exchanging the two components of the tensor product is a non-trivial operation, what's called non-co-commutative. How to define the entanglement in this case, I think, is very interesting. And point number two, the loop model entanglement does coincide with the quantum group entanglement entropy and allows us to generalize it. So, in fact, something that some of you may have noticed is that when we use this kind of business here, we are really making a distinction between left and right, and you may worry what would happen if you had a periodic topology, where is left and where is right. 
Well, the quantum group entanglement is kind of hard to define, but the geometric entanglement based on loops is still very easy to define. All right, now I must speed up a bit. This kind of tool can be used to demonstrate that C is, that the entanglement is C effective over free log L over A when you have a non-unitary conformal field theory. So let's just discuss this a little bit. That's what I will call the Coulomb gas calculation of entanglement. So you see, when you think of it, it's kind of baffling because a lot about conformal field theory has been understood using this Coulomb gas technique, which consists in mapping conformal field theories on a free boson with some charges at infinity. And in fact, very little about quantum entanglement has been proven this way. For instance, S is C over free log L over A. To my knowledge, was never proven like this. It was proven using more general conformal field theoretic arguments. So this is an interesting calculation anyway, which can be useful even beyond the realm of non-unitary theories. Anyway, let's now take a Hamiltonian with many temporal ellipse generators. And it's known that this Hamiltonian is critical. It's PT symmetric. In fact, it has real eigenvalues. And it's also known that its central charge is 1 minus 6 over xx plus 1 if I parameterize the anisotropy parameter q by e to the i pi over x plus 1. Now, the ordinary entanglement, if I took this large chain and a segment of length L and calculated the entanglement the usual way, we know that this entanglement would not depend on boundary terms in particular. And of course, when I add all these EI terms, because EI differs from the XXZ generator just by a boundary term like this, if I add all the EI, as you see, these things cancel out, except for the first and last term. So in fact, it's pretty clear that the ordinary entanglement for this system should be 1. I mean, the central charge should be 1. That's the effective central charge. But now let's study instead the quantum group entanglement entropy. So this is a calculation which is a little bit difficult, but I'm just going to go over it very quickly. How would I calculate the quantum group entanglement entropy for this system? Well, I would use my loop model formulation. So what I would do is, as usual, calculate trace of rho to the n by taking n copies, by taking a cut and identifying the various copies along the cut in order to manufacture trace of rho to the n. And now on my Riemann surfaces, I need to define a little bit more what I want to have. So because the EIs have this loop interpretation, what I'm going to have on each of the sheets is a loop model. That's point number one. And then I have to be a little bit more careful about what I'm going to do with the cuts, okay? Because the essential question in this story is when you have these cuts here, so you can have loops in the plane for which the fugacity will be n as usual, but then because of the cuts, you can have things more complicated. So for instance, if a is on the edge, it's slightly simpler to represent. You can have loops that wind around the system by going around all the cuts before coming back to the origin. So they are not contractible on the Riemann surface. And now the question is, what is the entanglement going to be? How should you calculate the weight of all these loops? And the answer is, if you really want the entanglement the way I have defined it, what you should do is simply calculate this partition function where all the loops, not only the contractible ones, but also the non-contractible ones, all these loops should have the same fugacity. This is what you should do. Okay? Um, by the way, a remark which is important is that when you consider a topology like this, when you think of it a little bit, you realize that what you call the density operator is really what I wrote O left, O right. Because when you're having a plane like this, the zero temperature propagation really forces, I mean, defines the density operator as a projector onto the ground state, which is not the same as O right, O right. So anyway, um, what you need to do is a calculation of the partition function of this loop model on this Riemann surface. In fact, it's not very complicated, but I see that time is short, so I'm not really going to discuss it much. Um, what you need to do is nonetheless quite simple. You're going to have, well, it's an XXZ spin chain, so you can bosonize it. So pretty much you're going to have N bosons, one on each of the sheets. And then you're going to have to be a little bit careful with the loops. So the loops 
in the bulk having a weight which is n q plus q minus 1, a real number between minus 2 and 2. To reproduce this weight, you have to put a charge at infinity. That's a slightly technical operation. And more to the point, maybe you also have to do something at the insertions, at the two edges of the lips, because you also want non-contractible loops to have the same fugacity. So when you do all that and you calculate the partition function, it is a result that is rather easy to show that the partition function scales like the two-point function of an operator, which is well identified in the N boson theory. It has this dimension. And when you calculate, of course, the central charge, you find that the quantum group entanglement entropy does scale with the true central charge, not the effective central charge, which is the result I wanted to prove. Um, all right. So I'm going to pass on that calculation. I wish I could explain it more, but I'm running a little bit short. I want to say a few words about non-unitary minimal models. What do non-unitary minimal models have to do with loop models? Well, in a certain sense, the loop model still had a structure which was a simple tensor product. The action of the quantum group generators was not a trivial factorized product, but nonetheless, these uh, models had a structure of a tensor product, C2 to the N. The lattice realizations of non-unitary minimal models are a little bit more complicated because they involve what's called restricted solid on solid models. So there are models whose variables are not spins but heights, Li, taking values from 1 to some integer. In this notation, it's P minus 1, subject to incidence relations that ne neighboring heights can differ only by plus or minus 1. This is really a model, a space for kinks, right? Not a standard tensor product Hilbert space. So you can define the entanglement in a model like this by just taking a little bit dumbly the trace over the degrees of freedom in B, even though, again, the space doesn't have a simple structure of a tensor product. And when you do this calculation a little bit carefully, you realize that you can map the RSOS model, again, on a loop model. But in this case, there are all kinds of different loops. So you have the loops which are contractible, which live on the sheets, and they still have the same ordinary fugacity N, but then the loops which are not contractible may come with different fugacities. And when you take this into account, you realize that you can identify the real central charge and you can identify the effective central charge, and these two objects differ. When you give to the loops that are not contractible the same weight as the loops in the bulk, you get a central charge which is the true central charge, but then you must sum over various sectors where these loops are different weights, and one of the sectors gives the effective central charge instead of the real central charge. So it's a bit technical, but the important point is really the entanglement in an RSOS model is not trivial because of the structure of the Hilbert space, which is really not a tensor product. And when you take this into account a little bit more carefully, you see why the effective central charge comes out when you're looking at the non-unitary case and it would be the ordinary central chart in the unitary case. All right, so there are numerics, which uh, I think I'm going to pass because I want to have a few minutes to talk about something else. So the context we were interested in was, in fact, not minimal model. We were interested in supersymmetric systems, in particular systems with super algebra symmetries, such as, for instance, percolation or the Hamiltonian describing the plateau transition in the class C of topological insulators. This is the kind of theory for which the central charge is zero. And one of the questions is then, can we define a non-trivial entanglement in these theories? Are we going to get some non-trivial entanglement? What is going to be the effective central charge of these theories? And all that. So this is the kind of question we were in fact intending to study, that is, do the calculation for the entanglement in systems where the non-unitarity comes from the supergroup symmetry instead of coming from these bizarre Q and Q minus 1 factors in the Hamiltonian. Well, luckily in this SL21 case, the calculation can be done very simply because it corresponds in fact once again to this temple algebra in the particular case where E squared is equal to E. 
So when you have a supersymmetric formulation for this algebra, what you do is you take alternating representations of a algebra called SL21, and um, these representations have three states. Two of them are bosonic and one of them is fermionic. So the essence, the gist of the calculation is if you calculate things with super traces, because you have two bosons and one fermion per representation, two minus one is equal to one, so really whenever you take super traces, the system behaves like it's a trivial system. It's only got one degree of freedom per edge or per point if you're thinking of a spin chain. So everything is trivial and you would find an entanglement which is zero. So an entanglement defined with super traces is only going to be zero. But if you define the entanglement by taking traces instead of super traces, which after all is what you may want to do, then you will get a non-trivial entanglement for the two-spin example and for the CFT as well. So when you do this exercise for the SL spin 2-1 spin chain or percolation, instead of getting an entanglement C equals zero, you get an entanglement C effective over 3 log L over A, and C effective is a highly non-trivial number which we can calculate. In fact, it's this extremely bizarre number. So that, if you wish, is the effective central charge for the SL21 spin chain, which is definitely something that has a meaning, but I don't have time to explain that. So trace instead of super trace is a good way to see about the non-trivial entanglement in cases where you have some supergroup symmetry. All right, conclusions. Um, well, it may look like what I've dis discussed is kind of specialized and technical. In fact, it's not. In fact, to a very large extent, all the non-Hermitian Hamiltonians we are interested in these days do have some sort of geometrical representation like the one I discussed or are related to supergroup symmetries. The transition between the plateaus in the ordinary quantum hole effect is related to GL22, for instance. There again, you can apply these modified definitions of entanglement adapted to the non-unitary case to get some non-trivial results for theories which all have central charge zero formally, right? So it's definitely useful to have a non-trivial value of the entanglement. Beyond that, this kind of lattice analysis and Coulomb gas discussion, I wanted to present it mostly because it sheds light on a variety of issues and that's where I would like to conclude. I would like to show these issues to the public um, because I find them haunting. So there are two issues I find particularly fascinating. One is Okay, instead of thinking of non-unitary theories, how about going back to unitary theories, but unitary theories with a non-compact target space, like Liouville or the black hole sigma model, the SL2 r over U1 sigma model. In these theories, you know there's a problem with the norm potential non-normalizability of eigenstates, okay? So how is the entanglement going to vary in this system? This is going to go like, C over 3 log L over A, C being the true central charge, or some other quantity when the ground state is not normalizable, which is the case, for instance, in the black hole sigma model. This is an open question, and in this black hole theory, the central charge is 2 plus 6 over K minus 2, but the ground state is not normalizable. The lowest eigen energy state, which is normalizable, would correspond to a central charge 2. Is the entanglement going to be given by this prefactor or that prefactor? We don't really know. I think it's this one, but I'm not 100% sure. So that's an interesting question. Other interesting question is, again, if you go to theories which have a continuous spectrum, what are the corrections to log L over A dependency, right? So one way to approach this is, for instance, to take the M goes to infinity limit of minimal models. I said minimal models were described by RSOS model with a certain number of heights, finite number. If you send this number to infinity, you can in fact approach the Liouville theory at C equals 1. And that's another interesting question. How does the entanglement vary? Is it just a log L or does it have additional correction? And in fact, the lattice analysis suggests that um, it should have a term log log L over A which is something Benjamin and Oleja have been working on as well, um, with an amplitude whose nature is not totally clear. 
It may be zero. I don't think it's zero. I think I can prove it's not zero in this case as well. But it's not totally clear whether it's universal or not. And it's not so far been observed numerically. So that's another interesting question, which I think the lattice construction allows you to get a hunch on. All right, that's it. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Hubert. Okay, yep. oh. I had a question on this. No, that actually, I think this has been observed numerically, even out of equilibrium. There are several. Out of equilibrium, where you have a linear behavior log t, uh, t after a quench, they observe there is a log t correction, quite clearly, by Mark Medze. Ah, in a quench. In a quench, but it's the same story. It's, it, but it's very clear evidence, just it's, in, uh, the effect is announced because you have exponential of L, so, and it's clearly the same story. I know it's not been observed in the Brownian case, right? I mean, the Gaussian model uh, in the harmonic, harmonic chain. Yeah, harmonic, no that's what right? uh, Mark Medze also does. Okay. Okay, then, okay, Mark. So I have two questions. So, first of all, in, in the non-compact case, uh, the entropy will have another divergence, not a UV divergence, but a target space divergence, right? So that doesn't one have to so. be more careful? I, I don't see why. I mean, certainly, in the, you know, for a compact boson in the non-compactification, in the decompactification limit, you pick up another divergence. So... From where? From the fact that the target space has infinite volume? From the fact that the ground state is not normalizable? Ah, from the fact that the ground state is not normalizable, yes. Okay. But it's in that case, it's very close. I mean, it's, it touches the bottom of normalizable states, right? So even in a non-compact boson, you would find one third log L over A, I think. Yeah, in terms of the L dependence, but then you'd have an additive. So I'm just wor you know, okay, worried another, that that would... Okay, okay. No, but we're talking about the L dependency. Here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my other question is about, so I, I didn't, yeah, I mean, um, in the first part of your talk, as far as I understood, you were discussing PT symmetric yeah. Hamiltonians, and that was kind of why you ended up with a real spectrum, and you could talk about what was the ground state and so on, right? Yeah, fair enough. So my understanding is that in, in PT symmetry, one, one way to think about it is if you change your um, inner product, then your Hamiltonian becomes Hermitian. Uh, so I'm wondering if you think about it from that point of view, so that then your system becomes Hermitian, and then you just use the standard definitions, d do you end up with your definition, or? I don't want to change the inner product. I, th I think really the nature of the product is fixed by the, f by the fact that we're doing conformal field theory. So really, uh, I don't want to change the inner product the way they would do in a PT symmetric theory. Uh, I, I don't think I have this flexibility. I, see. Uh, I mean, what what you would want to do is, I think, what you the kind of inner product you're having in mind would be like treating my parameter Q as some sort of formal variable when I go from left eigenstate to right eigenstate. Yeah. But no, I really want to describe a system with the ordinary scalar product. Um, that's that's fixed by the time evolution on the on the plane, for instance, at vanishing temperature. Um, so I I don't think it's it's related with that. But um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I I never I never thought much about this modified scalar product for this kind of theories because there's no real reason to do that. Um, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. Are there more questions? I saw. Can you Thank you. Uh, it's more actually referring to the previous question. Um, I think there are some papers actually about that from the PT symmetry community. But uh, I think it's a little bit problematic because you can do that. You can change the inner product and then redefine all your operators, your Hamiltonian and everything in a Hermitian way. But when you, when you do that, you lose, you lose locality. No, I, mean, I think that's a big issue because then what are your spins? What are your subsystem A and B after you have done that? Uh, so from that point of view, it's quite unsatisfactory to do that, although there's some work uh, along those directions. 
Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I have a question about the top part of this last slide and the relation to the 2D plateau transition. So in 1D, if I've got a critical Fermi system, then the entanglement of the Slater determinant is the entanglement of the CFT. Uh, I'm conf when you say loop entanglement seems to be the most useful definition, is there a what is the relationship between the loop entanglement of the spin chain and the entanglement of the physical Slater determinant of quantum Hall? And they dimensions it's sort of non-trivial that entanglement I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a good question but I I, I don't really know um, certainly if you think of the loops as electron trajectories um, it, it could it could have a meaning okay I didn't think of that but it's an interesting question yeah, in fact, we've been wondering about the entanglement in the Brownian case also. If you have just Brownian motion, can you kind of understand geometrically the entanglement that you would have in a, in a free boson, C over free log L? What does it mean? It definitely means something in terms of the Brownian motion. So maybe I take my answer back. Maybe there is an answer to your question, but I don't know it really. Anyway.